Hello, it's Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vet. This is Vet Chat, the UK's number one veterinary podcast. And it's February and of course it's Veterinary Dental Month and I'm super happy to have Norman Johnson, um, really one of the founding fathers of veterinary dentistry in the UK, with me on the podcast today. So, Norman, welcome to Vet Chat. Thank you. I'm very, very privileged to join you, actually. Honoured. Oh, well, listen, Norman, it's very much reciprocated because I remember very, very much early on in the career hearing about you doing veterinary dentistry. It was something that really, I qualified in 1990. It wasn't taught in, in veterinary schools. And I'm not sure the situation has improved nearly as much as it should do because... I mean, dentistry is such a massive part of most GPs' workload, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, when I, when I was in general practice, we um, obviously I had an interest in dentistry from a really early stage, uh, but yes. uh, we, were, we were looking to have about a quarter of the ops in any given day to be dentistry. Hmm. Um, it's stuff that's there every day of the week. It's stuff that you can rely on. It's not seasonal, and it's necessary, and that's that's the thing about it. So... My, my my feeling in the early days is it was just being ignored because we didn't either know enough about it or were worried about our skills in dealing with it. So that was really what took me into dentistry as a as an interest in the first place. Plus the fact when you're a young graduate, you're the one that gets to do it. All the more, yeah. all the more interesting stuff gets done by the boss. <laughs> well, it was always an area that fascinated me because I think it was one of those areas that you could immediately bring relief to a patient and it wasn't until you know during the pandemic i had my own dental problems and of course dentistry was very basic during the pandemic so a tooth was yanked and i'd spent two or three nights not being able to sleep and almost that instant uh, relief from having that done and i saw this all the time in my own practice where dentistry in fairness was an easy diagnostic disease because often you smelt these patients before you saw them in the consulting room. They, you could sort of get a sense of them as they walked towards you from reception. Uh, the, the smell was often overpowering, and, and at that stage, it was very basic dentistry because it was the Yorkie or the cat that needed ten, fifteen teeth out. Yeah, and the first thing was well. The first thing was persuading people because they'd often been to another practice and it was an older dog or cat, and they were told oh, no, the cat or the dog probably won't survive the anaesthetic, so therefore yeah. don't do it. Yeah. And my attitude at that time was, but from a welfare perspective, the dog or cat is probably in so much pain, it's unfair to just leave it as it is. And I'd rather take the risk of an anaesthetic, knowing potentially I could lose a dog or a cat, although it happened so infrequently in my career, to lose a, you know, a, a dog or cat coming in for a dental, that this was a perceived risk rather than an actual one. Yeah. And you'd come back and the, the, the clients would say, this dog is five years younger than it went in. What did you do? And I said, I just took away all of its infection and its pain. So such an important area because, and you get such good results, don't you? I specialize in dermatology and often it was more kind of managing a problem rather than ever really getting rid of the problem. Whereas with dentistry, uh, relief and, and cure is is almost instantaneous, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the two obviously the oral problems were, were an issue with these older dogs and cats, but it was really the systemic infection, the low grade chronic infection that gave them lots lots of other trouble as well. Yeah. You know, so their kidneys and their heart and their liver and spleen and all the rest of it was uh, so they they just did better when you got rid of all that yes. burden of infection. And as you say, it was a relatively instant thing. But it was a, it's interesting when you say about you know, the older older animal and people really being worried about putting them under an anaesthetic. And of course, even, you know, when I was a, when I, I suppose say, I mean, I graduated in the 70s and certainly the anaesthetics were less sophisticated than they are now, but quite, quite a margin. Yeah. But even then, would they rather have their, animal live on in chronic infection and discomfort than have it sorted. You're yeah. sentencing them to the, the, the last year or so of their lives in, in, in poor health rather than dealing with it. And uh, the interesting thing about it was that, you know, even guys like uh, dentists and, 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 and doctors were the ones that were often most reluctant to 
you know, to yeah. regret the anesthetic. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Quite astonishing. Where members of the public would take your your take your advice on 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 yeah. face value, whereas you know the the dentist or the doctor would say, "Oh no, 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 I'm not having that." <laughs> But so, you know, also we had the same situation because there would be a lot of vets who would not put those yeah. dogs through an anaesthetic. And actually, yeah. all you needed to do was explain the procedure to the client. And if the yeah. client trusted you, as they obviously did yourself, then people would agree to it. Yeah, yeah. I think certainly once they, once, once there's somebody in the practice that actually builds up skills. Uh, yeah. That's that's uh, even if somebody else in the practice doesn't want to do dentistry. In my case, my two partners were really completely disinterested in dentistry because they did other things, and they had built up skills in other ways. But uh, mm -hmm. for me, it was a niche that I would, I, I started early on, and uh, once the high speed drills and things like that came in in the mid mid to late eighties. That completely changed the way we did dentistry. Yeah. Because, and I don't know about you, but certainly we had uh, we had a class of extracting teeth and cadaver cadaver German Shepherd dogs or something like that with things like Geely wire and hacksaws. And yes. you know, this medieval medieval instrumentation was still being taught in the 70s. Um, to once the high-speed drills came in, different. <laughs> well, I certainly removed a lot of teeth using a hacksaw, you know, to, to obviously split them. And that was, yeah. you know, in the 90s as well. So, yeah, it took time for the drills and, and so on to come in, but they were obviously revolutionary although i suppose it didn't build your arm muscles quite as much as the hacksaw did no it didn't actually there's no doubt about that <laughs> but that was the thing that your know, dentistry dentistry is supposed to be a, a something that's done with finesse and yes. uh, you know people worry that you know they don't have the strength or that kind of stuff you don't need strength actually you just need technique yeah exactly. Same as golf you know you don't whack yeah, the yeah, ball yeah. a long way by being you know <laughs> hitting it really hard <laughs> you stroke it don't you it's, exactly it's, it's, exactly it's, well, it's still just a I've never gone into, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I can understand it. Yeah, and and of course, the problem with a hacksaw was it would take me a long time to do yeah. all the extractions, and at some point, you'd also go, "Oh, do you know what? I'm going to leave, leave that tooth in. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. just can't. You know, because obviously, older dogs again, you don't want to have them under it or cats. You don't want them. Yeah. Cats, you didn't quite need to use the hacksaw as much, but. You, you didn't want a dog under for two or three hours doing a dental because that yeah. was a you know a long long anesthetic wasn't it well there's, there's another aspect to that really where um, your own welfare when you're when you're doing a dental procedure like that is quite important because yeah. your dentists recognize you know very clearly that their own dexterity and skill drops markedly after an hour. So they rarely will do a procedure that uh, takes more than 45 minutes to an hour. So yeah. They'll do something that takes that time frame, and then that would allow them to stand up, walk about, focus into the distance, um, see another patient with another problem. So from their point of view, really, they were they were keen not to spend a long time. And yet for us, we were still spending hours and hours and hours you know, yeah. on these, these uh, difficult extractions. So I think it was quite easy to then once the anaesthetics got better, then to schedule a second procedure for maybe two or three weeks when yeah. the original part is healed and you've got another another fresh look at it. Well, particularly also, you know, full cat mouth extractions. Again, that yeah. could be a long process. And of course, then roots would be left in. Um, I'm sorry, Norman, but I used to go in then when we did have the burr and, yeah. and drill them out. Um, I love um, one of our speakers on webinar vets, and I always mention him because he I, there is a bit of a bromance, probably only on my side, Professor Mike Willard, who was a professor at Texas A&M on gastroenterology, and he used to say, everything I taught you 10 years ago was a lie. I just didn't <laughs> realize. So there's definitely a fashion side as well, isn't there, of, about can you, you know, nuke... Um, uh, yeah. roots out should you leave them i had my own wisdom tooth taken out by an expert who obviously didn't look at the history before i went there because i had a hooked root mm -hmm. and this was why the the ordinary dentist wasn't doing it and he managed to leave part of the root in and he said oh it will just resolve don't worry about it so it, it's it's interesting when you you know there are two veterinary dentists in the room and they both agree with each other the one and this probably not a veterinary dentist it's kind of there's always opinions on these things. Where would you be now? 
uh, um, on kind of roots and things, particularly in cats? Well, uh, I would take it as a general as a general um, principle. You, if you leave a root in, you should go back and get it. Yes. Uh, you shouldn't leave a root in, but there are certain circumstances where you might. For example, the root might be very close to um, an artery, a nerve, you know, something like that, yeah. sinus, um, nasal cavity, these kind of things. So there may be features about that particular case that you might not want to to go back at, but. In general terms, the thing that is your friend is the radiograph. So if you do leave a route in, obviously you should log the fact that it's there on a chart or in a history and then offer the owner a, a, a review radiograph at some point because the radiograph will tell you whether or not it's an issue or not. It'll tell you, for example, whether it's resorbed, and they rarely do. Um, it'll tell you whether it's causing pathology. Because, say, that rat root may not have much organic tissue left in it. There may be virtually no pulp in it. Um, and it might just sit there quite happily, giving no problem. But, you know, the two things about it, if you don't look later, you won't know. And secondly, you can't ask the, you can't ask the patient. So the patient's not going to come back and say, you know, you're going to go back and say, listen, you know, that root you yeah. left in is giving me trouble now. Yeah. Whereas we can't ask that. So the radiograph is our friend when it comes to that. And interestingly enough, you know, although the radiographs have been sort of part of a dental procedure from our point of view, certainly since the 90s onwards. Now it's cone beam CTs. You know, a lot of, lot of practices that do this, uh, certainly a specialist, will have cone beam CTs or access to a CT scan. And CT yeah. scans tell you a whole lot more about the pathology that's there than a radiograph ever did. Radiographs do underdiagnose quite a bit in certain circumstances. And I know you're going to slap my wrists for using a bear to just nuke that, uh, that route. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. This, this, used, is the, this is yeah. the confessional <laughs> box we're moving into now. I had a, a, a couple of radiographs that were given to me by a, a friend of mine who I was mentoring through one of the diploma programs. Yeah. And it was a before and an after. Um, the before, well, the before actually, it was, it, was, it, was, it was following an extraction, but a route left. And yes. then the, the cat was sent to him uh, and he took a, an after radiograph. And the person who'd originally tried to drill the root out had missed it completely. So they've actually gone down the side of the root, right. not touched the root whatsoever, and gone into the, the canal, which has got, of course, the sensory nerve to the whole of the jaw on that side. Yeah. So I mean, that cat was in quite a lot of trouble. Now, that's yeah. you know, it, it's difficult actually to drill a, a root out because of the fact that Really, you've got water on in the go. Uh, yeah. You don't necessarily know what path that route follows, so it's you might be lucky and get most of or all of the route out. But in general terms, you don't. You know, they'll leave bits behind mm. walls of the tooth and so on. So it's not generally a good thing to do. Everybody, everybody that does dentistry likes to actually physically see the route in their hands when they've yeah. done that. Yeah, yeah. I think with dogs it was a lot easier, but often with cats, you you felt. I, they do resorb roots more, don't they? So they can do. I, I, yeah. One of the great advances has been around veterinary radiology, hasn't it? Because we yeah. we just didn't have that, and now we've got super machines like the Clark machine and so on that are handheld. Yeah. When did that kind of start coming in? You were obviously one of the first to start using it. When were you starting to use radiography as a kind of normal part of your dental procedures? Well, when I did the the, the academy exam, which was in, the, in, the, in 1990, yeah. I had to have radiographs for that. The credentials that went in for that um, involved radiographs. And once you start doing root canal treatment, of course, then you take multiple radiographs throughout the procedure. So I, I had a, there was a dentist uh, locally in Edinburgh where I was practicing at the time. They had retired and they had a garage full of stuff they just wanted to get rid of. And yeah. it's like a job lot for about a hundred pounds, you know. And that yeah, yeah. Involved seats, tables, radio, you know, the dental x ray machine, the whole lot. Yeah, yeah. And um, we had that on the wall for, I mean, it was an absolute workhorse. So he'd worked for, he used his whole career with this, this unit. And I used it for about another 12 years. So um, it was only just when it became, it had a little clockwork timer on it. And that health and safety eventually got to the stage where the clockwork timer just wasn't good enough, so that yeah. that's why it didn't it didn't it didn't have to go because it stopped taking good radiographs. It's just yeah. because it couldn't have a digital timer. So, uh, from really from the early stages on, but they 
as you say, the um, the little handheld uh, machines, they're a little bit controversial in some places because I think certainly, you know, for example, in Canada, I don't think they're they're legal. But right. they um, they certainly made a difference to practices that wanted to take a unit from place to place. If you were doing dentistry in say your main your main practice, but also maybe in a branch practice, yeah. it was great to be able to take this little thing with you in a case and have radiographs at the other end as well, because it it meant your your clients were getting a, basically a second class option if they were having dentistry done at a branch practice without radiographic facilities. So it was nice oh. to have that, but they were expensive and they were less good than the you know the, the, the is normal. that um, a he- in Canada a health and safety perspective it, that you worry about the radi- radiation. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although I think no, I in Europe there was never, never any issue with it, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, you know they had the yeah what the CE mark uh, for safety without yes. any difficulty. I think yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I was speaking to a colleague recently, and, and he said, you know, they have somebody who's specialising in dentistry in the practice. Mm-hmm. They're in a first opinion practice, and they ended up where. People were not doing dentals because the price was becoming so prohibitively expensive yeah. because the person wanted to do that dental absolutely correctly, but then without, you know, outside of the budget. So obviously we understand, you know, there are specialists like yourself and, and, and other certificate and diploma holders that often get referred, you know, as I did with dermatology, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. But how do we make it? applicable in first opinion practice what what are the areas that we can that we can do you know perhaps without using radiography or some of those other things that make it expensive i mean my dentistry was very basic it was tended to be scale and polish yeah and an extraction of it needed to come out and you knew that you'd done a good job or you hadn't because a week later the dog came back from being quite hang dog and miserable to being, as I said earlier, you know, five or six years younger than when they have walked in or appearing yeah. to be. Yeah. So how does that work? You know, obviously, Webinar Vet is about making that good GP better and more confident. Where do you see that sort of friction and, and friction between the specialist and the generalist in dentistry? Well, I think it's exactly the same as for human dentistry. I mean, you go to yeah. your high street dentist and you go for basic dentistry um, and they may or may not do other things down there and if they're not happy they'll send you on to you know an endodontist or a periodontologist or something like that but it's really really important that um, that first op- opinion practices across the land are comfortable doing good dentistry mm-hmm. I would always say that you know good dentistry doesn't need to, it shouldn't be expensive it should be something that the average client can afford because they're going to have to have it done several times during their animal's lifetime and it might just be a scale and a polish and the odd extraction, but it, price should not put them off. You know, it's not necessary to send, you know, a routine dental case to a, to a specialist because the specialist's business model, I mean, if you take just me, for example, I would be, I would be okay doing, say, two cases in the morning and two cases in the afternoon. And that was my specialist day. Now, if I was yeah. to take a routine case into that, I would still have to make enough money to cover half a, half a morning half an afternoon yeah. so it wouldn't be for me to do that stuff it would be much better if the first opinion practices were totally comfortable with it but that doesn't mean to say that they wouldn't use charts because charts are critical to the, the, the ongoing history of a case that you might see yeah. throughout its lifetime and radiographs and a full mouth once you've learned to take radiographs then it's not difficult i mean i've done mm. loads and loads and loads of teaching and current my practice I left still does, but you should be able to take easy radiographs of an animal's mouth in minutes. It doesn't take yes. any, you know, they're digital now. They don't have to be digital, but, you know, virtually everything is these days. So just perhaps maybe investing a couple of grand in a machine that takes them and will give you digital results and a few hundred pounds in how to do it. And it's a fantastic investment. So it doesn't need to be expensive. There's no, absolutely no way that you know that dentistry should be out of the reach of the normal customer. It's important that it isn't. No, that's a really, really, really good point. Obviously, you know, previously we were talking about when I went to vet school, there was very little dentistry taught. Yeah. It's such a massive area. I remember when we did one of our first series 
uh, with Hills Pet Nutrition, and we did a whole feline series, and we had dermatologists, we had um, a dentist, I think. We also had um, um, an orthopedic surgeon. And, of course, we were all vying for which was the most common problem. And I think, in the end, it was decided that it probably was osteoarthritis. If you get a cat to a certain age, pretty much all of them yeah. have arthritis. But, obviously, dentistry is massively important in most vets' mm-hmm. um, daily lives. And yet, I think I'm not sure that the universities have still really embraced it and taught it. You know, a big, big uh, load of um, material to learn when you're there for the five years but mm-hmm. dentistry is such a massive area i'm not aware that there's any specialists in any of the vet schools who are in there teaching dentistry on a regular basis so how do young vets get good at dentistry yeah well i think most of the most of the the vet schools will actually have somebody come in as a guest lecturer yeah um, I mean, over the I did Edinburgh, Glasgow, and London uh, simultaneously, really for for quite a while, yeah. and but it was only I mean, I think maybe at one stage five lectures uh, in whatever year it was, third or fourth year, and then a practical. Glasgow did a practical. London tried to do a practical, but it's just not possible to put big numbers these days through you know, once. You know, numbers got into three figures. It's very difficult to put them through a practical class unless yeah. you've got somebody in house. Um, I think it is important that that it's taught in house because if you're not on the faculty, if you're not a member of the staff, it's very difficult to actually lever a bit of time. But any of the schools that re- they're looking for um, maybe uh, American credi- 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 accreditation, um, yeah. AVMA accreditation, they they have to show that they facilitate dental teaching, and for many of them, it's a box ticking exercise that they don't tick the box properly. So mm. I think it's it, you know, it's been like this, Anthony, for thirty years. I'm not sure whether it's getting any better. In fact, I do feel it's getting worse because my my five block of lectures gradually shrank down to one. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know so. That, that just shows you how what sort of importance that particular school put on dentistry over the years. You have to have somebody you know, at the, as the head of the department who actually values that. And if they don't, then you're levered out for somebody else to get these, these errors. I remember going to a course that Bob Partridge was running just on doing cadaver extractions and learning the techniques. Yeah. And actually, once you learn those techniques, dentistry becomes a lot easier, particularly if you're not having to use hacksaws, sure, but you sure. have a you have a proper dental. I think a dental machine is kind of essential. Um, so, it, I, and it was a really satisfying part of my workload because these animals, as we said before, used to come in, you know, not not necessarily in distress because, of course, cats and dogs hide pain, don't they? But yeah. you saw the difference a week later once you'd actually remove that source of pain and, and discomfort yeah yeah i mean it's really 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 important i mean and, and go over a over a course of an animal's life it's an absolute certainty that they're going to need three or four dental procedures yeah one thing that's quite interesting actually i i have a black labrador who's now nine and when i was working i hold my hand up and i wasn't brushing his teeth every day and all that kind of stuff and labrador's kind of they're they're at the good end of the spectrum when it comes to periodontal disease unlike you know say for example a yorkie or a chihuahua but i would just do when i when i had a day where somebody had cancelled on me i would clean his teeth you know when when it was necessary and it it was the the last thing i did as a clinician was clean my own dog's teeth and I then decided, really, I wasn't going to put him through this every year or pay for it, as it would have been after that. Yeah, and I started yeah. to brush his teeth every day. And that be just coming up five years since that guy had his teeth cleaned. And it was only a few months ago that he had to have them cleaned again. And that shows the difference between bothering with cleaning his teeth yes. and not bothering cleaning his teeth. Um, a huge difference. Dogs are, are easier than cats, of course. Oh, yeah, and yeah, no yeah. cat likes to have a toothbrush rammed down its throat. And, uh, um, no, yeah. I was a doctor. Enough, but, you know, it's not easy. I wouldn't do mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll tell a story. I was adopted by a cat during the pandemic because, as you know, Norman, you never own a cat. A cat yeah. adopts you. I'm now his chief butler. 
a feisty little devil, a, 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 a ginger cat. And we knew who the family were who had the cat. It was a mile away. Um, I think uh, Buddy, as his name is, because we know who you know what his name was and everything, was a bit of a snob because the family lived, um, believe it or not, this was during the pandemic that he adopted us. You know, he started turning up. I was obviously at home a lot more, so I could see him. And the family lived on the worst road in Liverpool. Uh, it was called Corona Road. I mean, you know, house prices, everywhere went up house prices. If you lived on Corona <laughs> Road, I don't think the prices did so well. But anyway, in the end, I think he just basically was a 14-year-old cat. He wanted a quieter life because there were kids, there were other cats, there were dogs in the household. And it's just me and my wife at home. We've got a little garden at the front. So he used to stay in the garden and then gradually he sort of made his way into the house. My wife's allergic to cats. Oh. She wasn't really a cat person, but Purina had brought out a diet called Live Clear that makes the cat hypoallergenic to the human. She knew that I kind of wanted a cat, so she kind of said, well, he can come in a bit more. She, three, four years down the line, is now a mad cat woman. She loves cats. She yeah. loves him. She loves all cats. So he's been transformational. But when he first came in, he, you know, if I tried to look at him or touch him, he'd snarl at you and try and bite you. And I'm pretty quick, so, you know, I wasn't getting bitten. But obviously, I was, I'm, I'll hold my hands up and say I was a bit afraid of him. Finally, with all the love and attention, he's he's worked his way around. And, you know, we were able to look in his mouth. And, of course, he's lost most of his teeth. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, when he does give you a little bite, which he still does, it's not a bite. It's just a nasty suck. Mm -hmm. um, so this is often what happens with cats. The teeth just fall out, you know, without the... Uh, without the attention, but we are needing to get him in. But of course, now the waiting list to get into vets is difficult. So we're both in the same situation of having to pay for it. He's on Silencia <laughs> for his arthritis, but I have to say he does need uh, some dental work doing yeah. as well. Might not be much left to do. <laughs> well, I don't think there's a lot of teeth. Because the other one is that, that kind of broken canine that you saw a lot in, in yeah. cats and provided Dentine's not showing. I don't know how painful are they. Well, cats, they, they, they older cats, they they often have a problem where the canines super erupt, and they look yeah. as if they're they're much longer than they should be, but they're really yeah. being they're they're be, really being pushed out of the socket by a pathology within the socket. Yeah. And sometimes they resorb internally, which are what's called an external resorption. Yeah. It's not from the pulp outwards. It's from the the cementum inwards yeah. so you get this a lot in canine teeth and eventually these 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 go and some of them need extracted the stumps and some of them don't yes. but when you're looking at the end of a tooth if it, for example if the end of a canine is fractured in an older dog you, you maybe take away a two three millimeter chunk of tooth and not enter the pulp in which case it's called an uncomplicated crown fracture it's not complicated by an infection of the pulp yeah. but in a cat the pulp goes almost to the end all of its life so you may find even a millimeter off of a, of a of a canine tooth can open the pulp and then at that point you know of course there's a whole different kind of worms to deal with with pulpitis pulp necrosis eventually that may leak out through the 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 apical delta in, in the root where the yeah. blood vessels enter so it's a it's an odd one if you can if you have them under an anaesthetic, you can often use a very fine probe or a, a very fine root canal um, file to see if you can enter the pulp. And if you do, generally at that stage, it's an extraction or a root canal. Mm. The root canal can be quite quick and easy, actually, in these older cats. But uh, yeah. the radiograph will tell you whether he's got a proper route to do it, because often if the roots are resorbing too, there's no point in doing anything at, uh, like a root canal, because there might be no root canal to fill. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, the difficult ones is, but they're hard, to, often hard to spot because it's not much off. You often find them incidentally. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know. Again, a seventeen-year-old cat. I did blood work recently just to see how he was doing, and and liver, kidneys, thyroid, everything was just spot on. So he's uh, he's obviously doing well, and is a physically fit cat even for 17 so i think he hope, hopefully he'll be around for a bit long he's actually our cfo in the company i was over in america and he was displayed on the the um on our flyers that we took over there 
of course, CFO stands for Chief Feline Officer. Mm -hmm. And he was actually, just before in a previous meeting, sitting on the computer, almost refusing to let me go into the meeting. So I had to remove him gently from uh, (laughs) even sitting on the laptop. So he, he often does come in, but he's outside at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Great companions. They they um, they they brighten our lives, don't they? And uh, yeah. they deserve the same dental care that that uh, uh, we hope to get as well from our dentists. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah, yeah, agree with that very much. Norman, it's been fascinating and fantastic uh, listening to you. It's been a while since we last chatted. You were always a big inspiration for me as a first opinion vet trying to do dentistry better. And and thanks for the fantastic legacy that you've left. I know with all the people that you've trained over the years as well. And uh, it's a good time to practice the golf. I think so. Just by the way, the, the headphones that I'm wearing, you gave me them in 2011. <laughs> we, when we started this <laughs> webinar we thing. Started, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they've lasted all that time, just with a quick change in the earmuffs <laughs> over the pandemic when they were used a lot. So I have to thank you for that as well. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, thank you because... We've been so fortunate to be able to use experts like you across the world to just hopefully um, improve the quality of postgrad training, which in areas like dentistry is so important because when we come out of ed school, um, unfortunately, we haven't had a lot of training. And I think this is a an area that, you know, as much as we can teach in webinars, I would encourage vets who are listening uh, and nurses who obviously get really involved in it mm-hmm. to go on some of the courses. Yeah that are available because I think with not a huge amount of time, you can get to a really decent GP level at dentistry, can't you? I think if the commonest and and most useful courses would be ones where they teach extractions and they teach radiography. And if you get these two fundamentals, um, just find the the principles of them and then begin to use these. That's, That's a day and a half well spent. You know, yeah. a good cadaver, a good cadaver course that gives you extractions on cats and dogs. I think that's that's really, really the best way you can yeah. spend some of your CPD budget for dentistry, anyway. And and actually, trying to take out a healthy tooth is a bit more difficult than trying so, to take so, a, a rotten one out, isn't it? Well, go back to 1975, and these they were German Shepherd dig cadavers and various bits of chisels and hacksaws and other yeah, carpentry, yeah. carpentry tools that were used at the time. <laughs> It's, it's come a far way and, you know, thank you obviously for all the stuff that you've done to, to further veterinary dentistry for the profession, both here and, and internationally. Oh, well, it's been a good, it's been a great career, actually. Yeah. I'm and and thank you for coming on today. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Norman, thanks again. Thanks everyone for listening. This has been Vet Chat, UK's number one veterinary podcast. Hope to see you on another episode or one of our one of our webinars very soon. Take care. Bye bye.